I think we'll get started. So welcome and thank you all so much for joining us for this Dublin Festival of History event, The Emergency, a visual history of the Irish Defence Forces during the Second World War. Um, the Dublin Festival of History is an annual free festival organised by Dublin City Council and run by Dublin City Libraries. My name is Kate and in a few minutes I'm going to hand over to our speaker for this afternoon but before I do I just wanted to let you know that there will be an opportunity to ask questions at the end of the talk and if you would like to do that you can use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type your question in there and we'll do our best to get to as many as we can at the end. And for those of you using social media to talk about the festival, you can use our hashtag HistFest2020. So our speaker today is Dr. Michael Kennedy talking about his book, uh, The Emergency, A Visual History of the Irish Defence Forces During the Second World War. And Michael is the executive editor of the Royal, Royal Irish Academy's Documents on Irish for Foreign Policy series. And in addition to editing 12 volumes of DIFP running from 1919 to 1965, he's published widely for over 25 years on Irish diplomatic, political and military history. His most recent books include the, the book he will be talking about this evening and um, a voice, uh, Ireland, a voice amongst the nations and Ireland, the United Nations and the Congo. And Michael regularly appears on radio and television and in public talking to a wide variety of audiences on aspects of modern Irish history and he's been recently assisting communities around the Irish coast who are seeking to discover the histories of their local units of the Defence Forces Second World War Marine and Coast Watching Service. So really delighted to um, have him with us this afternoon and without further ado I will hand over to Michael. Thank you very much Kate. I am um just going to share my screen here but uh, hello everybody and I'm going to talk for about the next 45 minutes or so on a book that I co-authored with uh, my colleague at the Royal Irish Academy Dr John Gibney and the Director of Military Archives Commandant Dan A. Otis and I'd like to talk about the uh, imagery and some of the the new aspects of Irish history we, that we discovered while we were researching uh, this publication. So the talk showcases uh, the book and what we would what I'd like to do is move through a very quick uh, slideshow talking about uh, some of the photographs in the book and various aspects of the, of the book and overall the argument of what I want to talk about this evening is an account of how during the Second World War the Chief of Staff of the Defence Forces Lieutenant General Dan McKenna facing a massive external military threat to Ireland created an army from very very limited resources now, this was no paper exercise. McKenna knew that should war come, he would lead the men and the women of the Defence Forces into battle. And those men and women, they're a generation passing into history, at the, almost entirely into history at the moment, are the subjects of my talk. And I want to argue visually that the wartime Defence Forces were indeed defending Ireland against an ultimate enemy. And McKenna's problem was, as he put it, who am I neutral against? There were real military threats facing Ireland during the Second World War. So forget the folksy history of the emergency. The Defence Forces continually anticipated invasion. And exercises were undertaken, tabletop exercises like this one and exercises in the field, about uh, what would happen if there was an invasion of Ireland. And this uh, document I'm showing you here from Military Archives is a scenario building exercise for what would happen if the British invaded across the border. And you can see from it that the Irish officers drawing up this exercise were absolutely ruthlessly realistic about their chances against a better equipped British force. You can see the British forces, the, the top, uh, the left hand side there, British forces come across the border between Loch Erne uh, and the Dundalk area. Dundalk falls very quickly, it's the street fighting, the LDF. Uh, can't hold the line uh, and then uh, there's radio silence from Dundalk and then you can see down at the bottom there uh, a, a motor squadron patrol was sent out to investigate and communication was lost with that uh, unit. It was destroyed by superior enemy forces. So the term emergency itself is a, a very real uh, one to the Defence Forces. It's most normally explained by reference to the Emergency Powers Act of 1939, the declaration of a state of emergency on the 2nd of September 1939. 
But the state of emergency was the penultimate phase in Ireland's transition to war planning. The final phase was a state of war. And remember, Ireland was only neutral until it was invaded. After that, Ireland would enter the war. And the reason for Ireland's trying to remain neutral was to, be avoid, to avoid being dragged into a great power war unless there was no alternative. The Taoiseach and Minister for External Affairs, Eamon de Valera, who you see here with, with McKenna and also with Frank Aiken, uh, didn't want Ireland to be dragged into a great power conflict. And war on the island of Ireland following a British invasion across the border, or a German seaborne invasion uh, from Rosslair to Cork and the uh, air uh, landing paratroopers landing around Dublin, uh, was a real possibility. And this cabinet agenda I want to show you here brings this out. This was the uh, draft prepared for the unthinkable, uh, the cabinet meeting after an invasion of Ireland. And you can see there that there are six points down the, the left-hand side of the document, uh, and the fifth one being request for aid against an invader. So the defence forces and the government took the threat of invasion very, very seriously. The emergency was no game. And a meeting between De Valera, McKenna, and the Minister for Defence, Oscar Trainer, who you see here in the, uh, the Trilby hat or the Homburg hat, uh, a meeting between these three men from the summer of 1940, with Germany uh, poised to invade Britain, so it seemed after the fall of France, had a very stark choice. And the meeting discussed if Ireland was invaded, would it resist alone before seeking British assistance? And the decision recorded was one word yes. So you can imagine what that cataclysmic scenario would have led to. The Irish military, the men and women looking back at you from this PowerPoint tonight, knew that overwhelmingly powerful forces were poised to invade Ireland. Ireland was only neutral until it was invaded, and we know now Ireland was a lucky neutral. Ireland had adopted a policy of military neutrality in 1922 upon gaining independence. And to follow Britain's lead automatically into the Second World War could very well have reignited civil war in Ireland. That very real fear of renewed civil war has, I think, become dulled with the passage of time. But the interpretations of later writers have been problematic here as well, because they've tended to turn the emergency into something of a cliche. Rationing, uh, ration cards, as you see here, spies, uh, isolationism, and the assumption generally uh, is that the Second World War happened somewhere else, not in neutral Ireland. And this has created, I think, an unfortunate impression that the Second World War did not matter to Ireland. But the reality, I think, was different. De Valera's assumption was that in a war between major belligerents, one of whom was Ireland's vastly more powerful nearest neighbour, the only realistic option for Ireland was to stay outside the conflict. This was the rational choice. Uh, even if there could be no guarantee that national, that uh, neutrality, sorry, excuse me, neutrality would be respected. Neutrality was a step into the unknown. Or, as senior diplomat, uh, Michael Wrynn, a legal advisor at the Department of Foreign Affairs, External Affairs as it was then, uh, who himself had a, a military career uh, during the Civil War, as Wrynn put it, neutrality was, a, uh, or neutrality for Ireland was a journey through the trackless desert of the neutrality law of modern wartime. And the prospect of being invaded by Britain or Germany remained a real possibility, at least until the summer of 1940. And it never really went away thereafter once the war turned east and then after America entered the war after Pearl Harbor. The threat of invasion by Britain recalled memories of 1916. The rising in the War of Independence like the Civil War were also within uh, living memory. The brutal intentions of, of Nazi Germany were, were also clear. Um, and they suggest that the Wehrmacht was in fact the ultimate enemy facing Ireland. In November 1939, Ireland's most senior diplomat, Joseph Walsh, wrote that the general feeling amongst our people is anti-Hitler because of his persecution of Christians and Jews. At the same time, Britain's propaganda about small nations is received with scepticism. It was not impossible that Britain might uh, seek to invade Ireland to seize naval facilities or to counter a German threat, a German attack. And in the same document, Walsh wrote that 
If Britain was indeed seeking the establishment of a regime of right and justice in the world, then there were limits within which, we, within which she would have to operate. And consequently, we in Ireland do not believe that she will make any attempt to violate our sovereignty. But a wariness of British intentions remained. And remember, it's not often talked about, but Britain invaded Iceland in May 1940 to deny it to Germany, using much the same arguments it would use if it invaded Ireland. So for the Defence Forces, the emergency was the penultimate phase in a sequence of events that would conclude with Ireland's small and under-equipped military making a stand against an overwhelming invader. The government would call for external assistance and Ireland would be at war. Neutrality was a strategic calculation, a pragmatic rather than a moral choice. Ireland would stay out of the war if at all possible. And Ireland was not the only European state to declare neutrality in 1939. And such declarations did not stop them uh, from German invasion. When German forces invaded the Netherlands and Belgium in May 1940, de Valera stated publicly that, I quote, it would be unworthy of this small nation if I did not offer a protest against the cruel wrong that has been done to them. The German minister, we would now say ambassador, to Ireland, Edward Hempel, replied uh, in writing to de Valera that he deprecated the statement and particularly the use of the word protest. Uh, but the fate of these small states was the fate de Valera feared would befall Ireland. And Hempel's comments, Hempel's implication, was that uh, Ireland, if it wavered in neutrality, could suffer serious consequences. Covert wartime assistance to Britain and her allies could help keep Germany at bay. Tensions in Anglo-Irish relations could be mollified by surreptitious cooperation. And Britain recognised that it was politically impossible for de Valera to offer open support to the allies. The Irish position was one of strict and public neutrality. This generated little sympathy from the Allies and led to tensions that persisted in Irish foreign policy, particularly relations with the Allies, long after 1945. But like other neutrals, consider the actions of the Swiss and the Swedish governments, Ireland's neutrality flexed to suit the state's geopolitical uh, location and its foreign policy. Dublin sought to navigate a path between both sets of belligerents, both of which were suspected of having plans, correctly suspected of having plans to invade Ireland. And this was not a passive position. In Rin's words, Ireland was, and I quote, expected to be firm in the enforcement of our neutral rights, will be legally entitled to be as drastic as the circumstances demand. And this included the scrambling of uh, Air Corps fighters uh, against air incursions over Irish airspace, as well as anti-aircraft batteries around Dublin and other locations opening fire on intruders and in a number of cases actually shooting down aircraft. Well, that's not something that was spoken about widely after the war. So what would happen if Ireland became involved in war? Devastating air attacks were likely with enormous loss of life. And in relation to Dublin, there were evacuation plans put in place after for a major air raid to empty the capital of its inhabitants within 24 hours into the surrounding counties of Leinster. So neutrality was not only about protecting Ireland's international sovereignty, it was about protecting the people of Ireland from the disastrous human consequences of war. Now, neutrality should have strengthened the case for the creation of a viable armed force to ensure the defence of independent Ireland. However, through the 1920s and the 1930s, the state's defence establishment was progressively run down from its civil war peak of 48,000. The reason was financial. Cutbacks brought the regular army down to just 6,700 by 1932. And with reserve forces included, the defence force's total strength was brought up to 15,500. In 1934, a volunteer reserve was formed and the paper strength of the defence forces rose to nearly 21,000, but this was still inadequate. In 1937, it was estimated that three infantry divisions, that's 48,000 soldiers, along with artillery, and a 12 squadron air force and naval forces, a combined total of over 100,000 men was what was required to defend Ireland. But in 1938, two reinforced infantry brigades and a handful of anti-aircraft units were all that the defence forces could raise to defend Ireland against a prospective invasion force of some 50,000 troops backed by naval and air support. These two brigades were judged effective only to maintain order against an internal resurgent threat from the IRA. 
But military spending did increase in 1938, but it was too little too late. The outbreak of the Second World War saw the defence forces mobilise an understrength force. Their paper strength was close to 20,000, but even this was 30% below the war establishment and what was actually required 37,000 of the ranks. And of course, actual numbers were much lower. The defence forces, you see some uh, infantry men here, uh, lacked the range, particularly of heavy equipment, possessed by most contemporary European armies. But the infantry, you can see that the, the men here carrying them, carried the very effective Lee Enfield uh, number one Mark III rifle, one of the standard British infantry rifles of the Second World War, and, and still an effective weapon uh, up into the 1960s. And despite his German looking, but in fact British made, uh, Vickers uh, coal scuttle helmet, the Irish infantryman of 1939 bore a number of similarities in terms of kit and weaponry with the British Tommy of the same year. Indeed, the procurement of, of weapons in leading up to the, the years leading up to the war had saw some small amounts of, of very good, excellent uh, infantry equipment being bought, uh, such as the, the Bren light machine gun. The problem was there were too few of them, only 20% of the order uh, actually arrived from Britain before uh, hostilities broke out. And then there were some duds. The, the boys' anti-tank rifle was uh, next useless, although Finnish forces in the Winter War said that uh, it uh, found it a useful weapon in, in other than anti-tank roles. There was also some um, state-of-the-art anti-aircraft equipment. The, the, the Vickers 3.7-inch anti-aircraft gun that was the standard Defence Forces medium anti-aircraft gun during the war uh, was in, in use throughout the Battle of Britain. And finally, the um, Swedish-made Bofors 40 light anti-aircraft gun was a, a very advanced weapon for the time, and Irish plans uh, had in, included uh, using them in a remote-controlled capacity uh, through various uh, pieces of equipment that never turned up, and in fact only I think four or six of the weapons actually arrived uh, by uh, shortly after the outbreak of the war. So defence plans had to be put in place with what was available rather than what was ordered or what the Department of Defence and the Defence Forces hoped for. And in late September 1939, the government decided that as Ireland was not directly involved in the war, it could not have afford any way to maintain the Defence Forces at its full uh, war establishment. Now, the danger the IRA uh, presented was highlighted by their raid on the magazine fort at the Phoenix Park on the 23rd of December 1939. And the raid, as many of you will know, saw the seizure of almost all of the army's stock of reserve uh, arms and ammunition, the small arms and ammunition, though most of this was later recovered. It was in the aftermath of the magazine fort raid that McKenna was uh, brought in as chief of staff, replacing the, the veteran general uh, Michael Brennan as chief. Um, some elements in the IRA sought to align themselves with Germany and, and consequently de Valera's policy was to emasculate the IRA to a harsh domestic security policies, including widespread internment and uh, at times execution. And that left the defence forces to deal with a far greater external threat to Ireland. After the fall of France in June 1940, the Irish government finally realised the immense military threat facing Ireland. An invasion of Britain and Ireland were thought likely to follow the German victory in France a general mobilisation was ordered. The defence forces were, however, very ill-equipped to engage invaders. The army, as we've seen, was primarily a light infantry force. The Air Corps, with its headquarters at Baldonnell, southwest of Dublin, and the Marine Service, based at Hull Bolan in Cork Harbour, were small and operated under army control, and neither could fulfil their missions with the resources at their disposal. The Air Corps operated aircraft which were almost obsolete by 1939, and they could not offer an effective air defence of Ireland. Although the Gloucester Gladiator fighters that you see here uh, with the RAF were uh, of immense importance in the defence of Malta, and in uh, their Irish uh, use were uh, scrambled at times during 1939, uh, 1940, 1941 to meet incoming threats. But in reality, it was the Luftwaffe who had air superiority over Ireland until mid 1940 the Allies thereafter gained control for the remainder of the war. In 1942 and 1943, the uh, 
uh, Coastal Patrol Squadron was disbanded in favor of concentrating on the development of two fighter squadrons. Only one was established, and number one uh, fighter squadron flying the end 11 Hawker Hurricanes uh, which came into service in 1943, was based at Rhinana, uh, Shannon, and later moved to Gormanston in Meath in 1945. But I think we should bear in mind in, in making these comments that it was Air Corps pilots along with Air Defence Command units, anti-aircraft uh, gunners, who did engage with Allied and Axis uh, units over Ireland and were on the front line, did see active service uh, during the Second World War, during the emergency. The Marine Service, founded in 1939, had two ageing vessels, you see them both here, the steam yacht uh, Marku on the left, and the converted trawler Fort Rannoch on the right. And these were joined uh, later by six modern motor torpedo boats, but it too was unable to mount a, a credible defence of Ireland. The torpedo boats proved, as you can see here, ill-suited to patrolling Ireland's rough coastal seas, and were mainly used for, for estuary defence, harbour defence, and Cork and Shannon. There was also uh, coastal defence artillery, inherited from Britain in 1938 after the return of the treaty ports. Six uh, inch guns and, and 9.2 inch guns. And a, po a port control system was initiated. Uh, mines were laid in Cork and Waterford harbours as defence measures. And my own area of interest, and I think one of the success stories of the defence forces during the war, was the Coast Watching Service, established in 1939. And it proved very successful as a key component of Ireland's air and marine intelligence network. Well, from 1932, 1942, excuse me, it came under army rather than marine service control. So the marine service was, in essence, militarily uh, ineffective during the Second World War. And as Joe Walsh, the Secretary General of the Department of External Affairs, uh, said on a number of occasions, the Royal Navy, in essence, uh, defended Ireland's coastal waters from the high seas beyond Ireland's territorial limits. So consequently, the army remained the, uh, at the centre of Ireland's military strategy and heavy weaponry uh, was, was lacking. Uh, there were few tanks and uh, armoured cars and McKenna sought to overcome these deficiencies uh, to create an army that could, as he put it, offer prolonged and organised resistance to an and while numbers could be and were expanded rapidly, the defence forces remained uh, seriously deficient in modern weapons and communications equipment. And those deficiencies became more pronounced as the forces were enlarged. Uh, I show you here uh, a picture of uh, a radio set, one of 130 built by Pi in Dundrum, um, an Irish uh, model about which very little is known. I think this might be the only picture of it in existence, but the Defence Forces began to investigate ways of overcoming uh, supply difficulties by uh, building in Ireland. The radio here I show you as one example, and earlier in the, the 1930s, the, the Leyland armoured car uh, was another based on the earlier uh, Landsberg model or the contemporary Landsberg model, which you see there. So to summer 1940, Britain had remained hopeful that Ireland would at least make the treaty ports Cove, Bearhaven and Loch Swilly available to the Royal Navy. When Chamberlain was replaced by Churchill in May 1940, relations between Dublin and London deteriorated rapidly and Britain demanded the use of the ports uh, as the threat from Germany grew and British losses in the Atlantic, back into the Atlantic increased. Despite the threat of a British invasion, and I'll show you the minutes here, uh, British-Irish military staff talks in May 1940 reached agreement that in the event of a German invasion of Ireland, the defence forces would fight for 24 hours before requesting British assistance. Advance columns of British forces could be in Dublin within two and a half hours of receiving the call to move south. But despite this offer of assistance, McKenna's task remained the creation of a combat-ready field force that could meet any invader without immediate assistance. On the 4th of June 1940, the government agreed to expand the army to 42,000, but lack of weapons and the inexperience of the new recruits worried military and political leaders. The deployment of reserve officers allowed McKenna to use men who had seen action in the War of Independence and the Civil War to build up an expanding officer corps. And by the September 1940, strength had risen to 37,000. 
new brigade and unit commanders were judged by British observers to be, as the British military attaché in Dublin put it, good, professionally keen and commanders of men. But McKenna was acutely conscious of the resources, that, the limitations of the resources at his disposal. He placed his faith in the abilities of his men as guerrilla fighters, harking back to the experience from uh, the War of Independence. And though it recognised that this uh, uh, guerrilla fighting uh, might count for little other than propaganda value, McKenna expanded the army's uh, frontline forces into four brigades, one for each of the military commands into which Ireland was divided. And he hoped to use uh, two brigades to face an invasion from the north, two from the south. You can see there the basic plan here. Brigades were about 5,000 men each, and each was divided into uh, independent mobile columns, uh, effectively battalions, and then those battalions were divided into mobile companies, and each mobile company operated as an independent fighting force. From the summer of 1940, these uh, units were placed around uh, the border area, and uh, uh, as you can see here, a unit in County Monaghan, um, a mobile unit based there, potentially to counter a, a British invasion. Now, the question of the defence of Dublin also arose, and you see here an operational order from late 1940 about countering an airborne assault on uh, Dublin. A British invasion was expected to come across the border, a German invasion would be uh, by uh, parachute troops, paratroopers on the flatlands around Dublin. And you can see here uh, the plans that were put in place for an inner defence cordon, uh, the inner uh, shape is the lines of the Dodder and the Talca to the north, and then outside that, the line joined by circles uh, is the outer defence perimeter, and the feeling of defence force planners was that uh, German paratroops would land within this cordon, and um, the units, two brigade, who were in the, the previous uh, document, would do their best to engage with these forces as they arrived. There was also the question of a, an air attack on the city. And this would probably happen at the same time as parachutists landed. And you can see here the deployments of anti-aircraft guns in, in Rings End, uh, in Booterstown, and in uh, Clontarf. And the sense was that uh, an air attack on Dublin would commence uh, down the line of the Liffey. And if you think the way Dublin is structured, you've got the port, then you've got government buildings, and then as you move down towards uh, today's Houston Station, you've got Defence Forces headquarters, a number of barracks and, and rail depots. So the entire strategic assets of Dublin at the time were uh, pretty much along the line of the River Liffey. Now, as we move into 1941, McKenna had other assets at his disposal. He could call upon a group of the local security force to assist regular forces. Numbering 85,000, this part-time force came under army control in January 1941 as the, the local defence force. It was a very widely varying quality, uh, age and efficiency of the men, and its actual strength was thought to be only about 60% of its paper strength. The defence forces themselves grew to nearly 40,000 men by 1941, but lack of weapons remained a real problem, as these next two slides show. You can see a piece of piping being used here uh, by a man who's not in uniform as a replica of Lewis machine gun. And finally here, you can see someone has uh, very creatively built a uh, piece of light field artillery out of balsa wood and the, the wheels of a cart of some kind. The problem was that procurement from Britain was uh, being prevented by Winston Churchill. And while understanding that the equipment was needed elsewhere, McKenna hinted to the British that unless further equipment was released, he could not himself justify the continuing liaison visits between British uh, and Irish officers. Small quantities of Bren and Vickers machine guns and ammunition were subsequently released, as were radio sets and gas respirators. And most significantly, there were deliveries to the Air Corps of Hawker Hector and later Miles Master training aircraft. And this was the largest supply of equipment that had been seen since July 1940. But there was no meaningful deviation from Churchill's directions. Anti-aircraft and anti-tank gun supplies remained withheld in Churchill's orders. Yes, lest they be used against British forces invading Ireland. Anglo-Irish relations remained strained at political level, 
but strong diplomatic and military links uh, were established, which enabled relations between Britain and Ireland to withstand these political tensions. Neutrality accommodated limited discrete cooperation with Britain on war-related matters. And you see here a memorandum drawn up by Joe Walsh in 1941, in May 1941. It's in the National Archives and it's in the Documents on Irish Foreign Policy series available online. It's one of the most important, I think, documents on British-Irish relations during the Second World War. And it's entitled Help Given by the Irish Government to the British in Relation to the Actual Waging of the War. Well, the expansion of the army continued. Uh, the four new brigades were established in 1941. Uh, further armoured signals, engineer and motor squadrons were established. But as the threat to Ireland was popularly judged to have declined after the German invasion of the Soviet Union in June 1941, recruiting simply didn't keep up to 1940 levels. And ultimately, an army of eight brigades, organized as two divisions plus two brigades, uh, created a field force of about 45,000 men. And the expansion that I'm showing here showed how McKenna wished to mold the greatest possible proportion of the army into hopefully an effective striking force. Training was based on uh, the possibility that Irish neutrality could be violated at any moment by either belligerent and that the army must be in a constant state of readiness. Changes in the army structure were accompanied by changes in leadership. General headquarters was organized into forward and rear echelon, and provision was made for the Minister for Defense to appoint a general officer commanding field forces, and that was to be McKenna. Uh, he would command the forward echelon of the defense forces should Ireland be invaded. The former head of military intelligence, uh, Liam Archer, you see here, see senior officers here visiting on us later on, uh, Liam Archer was appointed Assistant Chief of Staff. Uh, he would uh, command the rear echelon in Dublin. And Archer, who had previously headed uh, the Intelligence Service, G2, was placed by the highly effective Colonel Dan Bryan, who, as befits an intelligence officer, is hiding there at the back behind Oscar Trainer. He's not the man with the, uh, the badger stripe down his hair. He's just the shorter man uh, just beside him. General Michael J. Costello, moved from being OC Southern Command to OC First Division, and Assistant Chief of Staff Hugo McNeil became OC Second Division. And while McKenna was deemed to be a good and conscientious worker, Costello and McNeil were the strategic brains of the army. From his headquarters in, in Cork and Collins Barracks, Costello commanded the First Division. He was responsible for countering a German invasion expected to take the form of assaults on Cork, Limerick and Waterford. Then from Carton House near Maynooth in Kildare, uh, Hugo McNeil, General, Major General McNeil's uh, second division was responsible for countering a British or an allied invasion from Northern Ireland. Defensive positions were improved through 1942. Fixed defenses of harbours and aerodromes were strengthened and additional anti-aircraft units were eventually delivered from Britain. Coastal defence artillery was augmented by a new fort constructed at Fort Shannon on the Shannon Estuary for the, to defend the approaches to Limerick, Foynes and Rhinana. Deep water keys and ports were mined at Hall Bolan and plans were put in place to drain oil storage tanks into the sea to incapacitate shipping that was using the port. Aerodromes and landing grounds were staked to prevent their use. And the aim was to prevent by every means possible the advance of invading forces through Ireland. McKenna still anticipated an invasion of such overwhelming force that the defence forces could not repel it without external support. Now, after the entry of the US into the war in 1941, Ireland retained really little strategic value for the Allies. Demands for the use of the ports evaporated as modern naval facilities and air bases were built in Northern Ireland. And ironically, the reality of the partition of Ireland may have prevented Ireland from being forced into the war by the Allies. By 1942, despite vigorous recruiting campaigns, the conditions of army service, low wages, the non-acceptance of married men as recruits, and a widespread feeling that there would be no invasion at all limited the pool of potential recruits. McKenna also faced the problem that many potential recruits were enlisting in the British armed forces and seeing actual conflict, and desertion too was on the rise and would remain a serious problem for the remainder of the war. As many as 150,000 uh, Irish men and, and women joined the, 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 the war effort in Britain. The figure has been much debated, but the fact remains that large numbers of Irish citizens 
contributed to the British war effort. It's, it's incontestable. The numerical strength of the defence forces on permanent service in 1942 was down to 38,000. During 1942, the expansion of 1941 was consolidated. New units were uh, developed, the nursing service was expanded, the local defence force was built into defence plans, and new units like the Construction Corps were operation. But it was not enough for these forces merely to exist, they had to train. And I want to come on to the final part of my paper now and look at the, the Blackwater exercises. Wartime training reached its high point during the Blackwater exercises in uh, Cork in 1942. And the location was chosen because it was the area most likely for a German amphibious assault. And Costello's 1st Division would meet that assault. And then uh, McNeil's 2nd Division would act as, as backup. A British minefield extending from Milford Haven in Wales across St George's Channel to Waterford provided some protection to the southeast, so the defences of the River Blackwater line were concentrated upon. And the exercises saw MacNeil's 2nd Division and Costello's 1st Division take to the field and engage in realistic attack and counterattack exercises. And I'd like to go through a couple of slides here uh, very quickly, I'm conscious of, of time passing by, but just to give you a flavour of um, the photographic history of the Blackwater manoeuvres. You can see there the way the country was divided there, uh, McNeil's red land forces attacking Costello's blue land forces and vice versa. There we see the situation on the 2nd of September as Costello in the south moves forward to uh, engage with McNeil's red land forces. On the ground we've quite a good uh, pictorial history here. That picture of the, the river itself features uh, in, in many of the pictures. You can see infantry fording the black water here. The, the exercises took its toll and that uh, uh, I think uh, a number of soldiers and, and officers were drowned crossing the, the black water. The caption on that is uh, anyone over six foot three uh, has to swim across. And motor transport being brought across the black water. An assault bridge being put in place while a cyclist squadron waits behind. Uh, field artillery on the move pulled by quad artillery tractors. And here a rather bucolic image, you can see the cows grazing in the background. Uh, infantrymen with the hand cart that they use to carry uh, weaponry like Bren guns and Vickers guns uh, around with them. A more athletic picture there on a Bren gun carrier. Troops uh, moving through Mitchellstown in County Tipperary. You'll never know what was being discussed here, but it's a, a picture of a BSA motorcycle and outriders and uh, cavalry trooper there with an LDF hat. Troops on the rest. Blisters, an inevitable part of the, uh, the Blackwater. Haircuts in the field. And um, shoe repairs in the field. And the, the story was that uh, soldiers went through two pairs of, of soles each on the, uh, during the, the manoeuvres field kitchen and those of you with high resolution screens can see the cigarette and the ash dangling out of the soldiers uh, mouth there uh, hanging over the hunks of bread that are to be served by troops soon to pass. You can see frying pans on the ground and a stove there with the doors open on the right hand side. Uh, the Lee Enfield rifles of the, both men, the person taking the picture and the, the soldier here, these things slung over their bicycles. Troops in another location enjoying hopefully bread. Exhaustion, feeding slit trenches in front of their bivouacs, uh, seen at that um, sunrise in, in somewhere in the, in the Cork countryside. Ice cream, and it looks like there's a, a wafer and possibly some sort of chocolate ice cream being had there. Refreshment of other kinds, uh, stout. And at the end of the Blackwater, De Valera took the salute in Cork and there was a, a massive parade uh, through the city of of uh, troops. So I can bring things uh, smartly to a conclusion here and after the, the Blackwater exercises. McKenna's conclusion uh, on the Blackwater exercises themselves was that they provided a succinct summary of the Defence Force's development from 1940 to 42. The Army is now an effective and mobile field force, he said. And despite this optimistic assessment, field forces remained far below strength and under-equipped. 
Black water exercises revealed serious deficiencies in field operations at strategic and tactical levels, and attempts were made to make them good during 1943. But from 1943, the supply shortages ensured that exercises on the level of the Black Water were not attempted again during the war. I think they weren't attempted until the 1950s. And instead, the emphasis was on individual soldiers' proficiency and training. Little equipment was supplied by Britain uh, in 1943. And as a senior British officer put it, any help which our services, our services have given to the air of people has not been because we feel particularly well disposed towards them, but rather to induce them to act as friendly neutrals. McKenna had tried to do his best with the resources available to him. But it was difficult for the British military observers in Ireland not to come to the conclusion that, I quote here, bravely as it would resist, the air army would be brushed aside by the sort of invasion that fell on Crete, as to say an airborne invasion. Well, the final war scare came in February 1944. Prior to the D-Day landings in June, the American minister to Ireland, David Gray, fearing a security leak from Dublin that would compromise the liberation of Europe, requested that Ireland expel Axis diplomats from the country. Dublin refused and expected the worst. Defence Forces units were sent to forward positions in Meath and Loud to counter an expected American invasion across the border. Washington, the State Department, assured Dublin that no invasion was planned. They also made it clear, however, that any intelligence leak concerning the invasion of Europe, uh, if it was traced to Ireland, the responsibility would lie with Dublin. The crisis passed and Operation Overlord was successfully launched on the 6th of June, 1944, but only after the Allied Supreme Commander, the United States General Dwight Eisenhower, consulted reports from uh, Black Sod Bay Lighthouse provided through the official uh, Irish Met Service, in fact, from uh, Maureen and Ted Sweeney here, uh, Ted Sweeney was the lighthouse man at Blacksod, but uh, evidence now shows that it was his wife, Maureen, who took the, um, the, the Met report that Eisenhower needed to show that there would be a brief period of good weather during which his forces could make for the coast of France. Well, after D-Day, efforts were made to repair relations with the Allies, but these were undermined in 1945 when de Valera controversially observed diplomatic protocol and extended condolences to Germany on the death of Hitler. This lapse of public judgment may have arisen because of the personal animus between David Gray and de Valera. Gray had demanded that the German legation in Dublin be handed over to the Allies before the Germans surrender. And de Valera was to show him uh, that he would act on his own initiative and not listen to uh, American demands. But the war in Europe was now over. Demobilization began and many former soldiers emigrated to Britain, the United States, Australia. Anti-aircraft positions were closed and coast-watching lookout posts were vacated. Coastal defence forts were mothballed and barbed wire blockhouses and air raid shelters and roadblocks were removed. Visible signs of the emergency vanished swiftly, but we can still, and I'm going to conclude on these points, see the uh, signs of the emergency across the landscape of Ireland. Jersey lookout post, air signs now being uh, restored around the country, the ruins of Fort Shannon, a pillbox on the River Barrow at Monaster Evan, pillbox at Rossnalla, photographed by my, my colleague John Gibney last year. And surplus um, supplies were sent off to uh, Europe as part of Ireland's small post war emergency aid programme. And as Europe returned to peace, Dublin kept watch on the policies of the great powers towards the smaller states. The experience of the emergency left a wary legacy with Ireland's political and military leaders during the Cold War. Historian F.S.L. Lyons' worn metaphor of Plato's cave used to describe Ireland's alleged isolationism and its emergence into the light thereafter to me seems misplaced. If Ireland was in such a cave, then de Valera, Walsh, McKenna and others kept a very close eye on the entrance, always looking outwards and, I hope I've shown tonight, realising how precarious Ireland's position was. The Second World War and the threat that the Defence Forces had sought to counter was, I hope I've shown, uh, far closer to Ireland than many Irish people recognise. And I hope I've shown you that plans for the defence of, of neutral Ireland were far more intricate than generally understood and that the resources at the Defence Forces disposal were frighteningly limited. Finally, I hope I've shown you that the neutrality declared in 1939 was never taken for granted. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Michael, for that brilliant talk. That was absolutely fascinating. And um, I should have mentioned at the start that um, this talk was um, done in partnership with the Dublin Port Company. So many thanks to them as well. And um, now we've got an opportunity to go into some Q&A. Before we do, um, I'd just like to apologise to everyone because I know we did have a little bit of a sound issue there. Um, but uh, I hope you could you could hear um, it mostly. I know it was sort of dropping in and out occasionally. We are recording this talk, so um, we will edit the audio and make sure that it's um, consistent throughout when you're watching back and that'll be available on the festival website. Um, so now is your opportunity to ask any questions using the Q&A box at the bottom. Um, so we've got a few of those coming in. Um, and while I give you a chance to do that, just a reminder that um, if you would like to buy a copy of The Emergency, um, you can do so at the publisher, worldwellbooks.com. And um, I understand that all royalties from the sale of this book will be going to the organisation of National Ex Servicemen. So um, definitely worthwhile, especially if you're thinking about Christmas presents. So um, we'll have a look at some of the questions coming in now. Uh, Deb asks, how were the lack of numbers in the infantry affected by any Irish going off to fight for the Allies? I think hugely in that, and who could blame them if, if you were, if you had had military experience or you wanted to uh, actually see active service, well, to be slightly facetious, were you better off cutting turf in the Dublin mountains or going and seeing action and, you know, my uh, people join the, the military for different reasons and uh, seeing active service would, would be one of them. So they they were hugely affected. I, I can bring in there the, the question of desertion and perhaps give you a, a, an example of how they were affected, a, a specific example. Um, Art McGuinness, who I wrote a book on the Congo with some years ago, Art started out in the emergency army and he was a commander of uh, a unit based up near the border. And he said that you'd wake up, bring your troops together, another guy gone another guy gone and the effect on morale was um, hugely uh, detrimental. Uh, in terms of actual numbers, McKenna simply didn't have the forces to do what he wanted and hopefully the um, slide there that showed that the third division was never fully formed shows the problem of, of, of the lack of men. So it, it was hugely detrimental in, in terms of having the, the bodies there to do the tasks in, in all uh, arms of the service. Thank you. Uh, Masha asks, based on your research, was Churchill's decision to withhold machine guns and anti-aircraft and anti-artillery weapons justified? To Churchill, yes. And I think McKenna understood this because the, the weapons were needed elsewhere. Uh, and it was a, a fine balance um, from the British point of view to keep the, keep the Irish on side. Uh, the weapons were more vital in, in the, the desert war and in, in certainly when before the United States come in in December 1941. Yes, I can certainly see, you can see it from the, the British perspective uh, entirely. Now, McKenna, I think, understood this. Um, when supplies were released in 1942, it was obsolete equipment and that kind of equipment that was released. So, yeah, I think you, you can definitely, you, you could give this paper from the other perspective and take the British example and say, well, you know, Churchill put it, Ireland is at war with skulking. And Ireland, from British perspective, should have, have got further involved. But I, I can, I think McKenna is doing the best with what's at, at his disposal. But look at it from Whitehall's perspective. Yeah, I, I think the, the questioner is, uh, is probably right. Thank you. Another question here. Uh, was there an official policy on the treatment of non-Irish deserters from UK or US forces and of Irish deserters from these forces? Um, great talk. Oh, well, thank you. Um, the, the official policy after the war was that if you deserted the defence forces, I think were absent for more than 150 days, 180 days maybe, you were barred from holding um, state posts in, in Ireland on your return. Uh, I, I didn't quite understand the first part of the question about non-Irish, I didn't pick it up there, but there was an official policy and uh, it, it wasn't, it, it was aimed, if you read the Doyle debates you'll see this, at penalising the men for deserting the defence forces, not for going to fight with the Allies. And that's very clear if you look at um, Harry Colley's speech, for example, in the Doyle, or um, I think William Norton of the Labour Party, I think his speech shows that too. Thank you. 
Um, Stuart says, thank you, Michael, that was excellent. I'm wondering about the role of women during the emergency. Were they involved in more roles than the nurses we saw? Um, well, uh, what we've tried to do is show the role of women as best as possible uh, from the resources that are available. No, it's, it, but it is mainly nursing services. Um, and I think there's probably a whole history there that, that we haven't captured of mothers, girlfriends, wives, uh, officers' wives, of, you know, of support there that um, we, we lost because th these men weren't living in isolation. Something I've tried to show in the, the pictures there was the, the Irish men of the period, um, the physique, the, the, the way that they looked, the haircuts and that. You don't get much of a picture of the Irish women of the period uh, through this because the, the sources don't show it. So I, I'd like to know more about that and I'd like to know what supports are coming in unofficially and outside Defence Forces channels. Um, and I, I, I can't uh, provide a, an answer other than what I've shown there, because as you remember, women weren't involved, weren't members of the Defence Forces at this period. Uh, and I think it was up until the 1980s, if, I felt, if I'm right, that um, women did not have a, a place or did not, were not recruited into the army. Thank you. Uh, another question. Some of the maps you showed are labelled Aero Defence Forces. Did they originate from a British source? Yes, they, they did. Um, some of the, the maps that will say that, I think there's one specific map I used, was from uh, the National Archives in Kew from a War Office file. So um, well, there, there, there's it's simply a case of finding whatever you can and using it appropriately. And that was the only map I had of uh, the breakdown by command areas and what forces were in what, uh, what command. So, yes. Thank you. Um, oh, my question just lost it there. Uh, a question from Alan. Why were Irish citizens who joined British forces 1939 to 45 so badly treated after 1945? Well, the, the if you join the, the British Army, the British forces um, of your own volition, you weren't in the Defence Forces, I don't know if you were badly treated. I mean, I had um, uncles who were in the RAF, I had one, one uncle who did two tours of duty with Bomber Command, and he ended up in, in Aer Lingus, wasn't badly treated. Uh, I think if you're talking about deserters, it's a totally different story. And, and then it, I think, comes back to the the Doyle debates I was referring to earlier, the, the, emer the emergency powers order after the war, and the sense of you let your country down. I mean, it's probably not a fashionable thing to say, but if you deserted, and that's where the story that Art McGuinness told me has always struck me so poignantly. I mean, if, if I had got a better offer and not turned up here tonight and left all of you in the lurch, how would you felt about it? And I think it's the, the, the same sort of thing. I'm sorry to put it that way, but that's the way I, I've always seen it. Um, people deserted for different reasons but the sense of the, the state afterwards as well, you let your country down, that's me. A uh, question from Elisa, going back to the uh, subject of the women, uh, were there any female coast watchers? Very good question. Um, unofficially, yes, because we've seen Maureen Sweeney there, um, the lady who took the weather report that ended up in D-Day, the D-Day landings. Um, it's the, the hope that the nature of coastal communities and, and how the coast watchers worked as a kind of official unofficial force and being to an extent left to their own devices and you know what you're doing you know you're part of the coast and there were no female coast watchers per se but the coast watchers were aided and assisted uh, by their sisters, mothers, whatever. And certainly when you're looking at the, the role of, of lighthouse keepers during the war, then it's a whole community of the people who live in the lighthouse and who um, keep a watch on the coast. So yes, unofficially, but not on the formal ranks of the, the coast watchers will you find any the, the names of any women. Thank you. Um, Deb asks, did you say that even married men weren't, that married men weren't recruited and did this change over time? No, sorry, I, I, unmarried men, I said, uh, when I was going through that list from, from 1942 of, of the problems. Uh, sorry, married men weren't recruited, you're right, yes, sorry. Uh, unmarried men were, yeah, that's correct. And that did change over time. I can't remember the exact date, but yes, that, that was the case. Thank you. Uh, Marsha asks, where can we find more information about those individuals who were pro-Axis based on the comp concept of the enemy of my enemy is my friend? <laughs> Oh, Lord, off the top of my head. Um, 
there are a number of books. David Donoghue's Hitler's Irish Voices is worth looking at. Uh, Neutral Ireland and the Third Reich, uh, quite an old book now by uh, John Duggan. Uh, Bob Fisk's, uh, Robert Fisk's, the journalist's wonderful book in time of war. Uh, Una Halpin's works on the, the Second World War. And then um, an older book, Enno Stefan, Spies in Ireland. And Mark Hull's book, um, what was it called? Irish Secrets, I think. That's on the, the, the spies who came into Ireland and their, um, their, their, their engagements. Um, you could probably also look at various histories of the IRA as well, we'll cover them. Uh, and there, there are other, other more recent books that just escape me at the moment. It's, it's a, a very uh, vibrant uh, field. You can certainly find a great deal more material there than I've just mentioned. Brilliant, thank you. And I think we have time for, for one or two more. Uh, why didn't the Irish government procure military equipment from the USA when the British government halted sales to Ireland? Very good. Um, they, they did to an extent in terms of uh, the vessels that were used for Irish shipping, well, not strictly military equipment, and simply the, it, it was turned down. There was an attempt to get, uh, turned down in both ways, uh, an attempt by the defence forces to look to the US was blocked in Ireland. And then when Frank Aiken was sent by uh, de Valera to, to see Roosevelt in, in Washington, um, he requested equipment from the Americans and Roosevelt said, well, who do you want to use this weaponry against? And Aiken bluntly said, well, Britain or Germany. And Roosevelt said, oh, sorry, that's it. You know, we're, we're not giving it to you. So it's, um, it's an interesting question as well, given that so much defense forces training, officers training in the 1920s had been uh, done at uh, American staff colleges, but that American connection wasn't kept up. Uh -huh. And uh, the procurement continued up until really into the 1950s, uh, well, later to be from mainly from British sources, then some from Sweden, Belgium, Switzerland, etc. Great, thank you. Um, and our last question, I think, is from Colin. How real was the threat of an invasion by either Germany or Britain in 1940-41? Was the German invasion plan, Operation Green, an advanced plan and realistic? Well, we're all wise in retrospect, I and mean, we'll see this with COVID now, what we you know, what people will know in 20 years time, but where we are now uh, will be very different to how we perceive ourselves to be at the moment. And the German invasion was not realistic, but the threat was felt to be very real. Uh, after the invasion of Norway, Germans lost most of their invasion barges. Uh, they didn't have the capacity to resupply any troops that might be parachuted into Ireland. They could certainly achieve a surprise attack, but then the RAF uh, would have, uh, and the Royal Navy would have control of the Irish Sea, uh, the, the St George's Channel, I should say. Uh, so how real, probably not in retrospect, but we're all wise in retrospect. Was the plan advanced? Um, it, to the best of my knowledge, allowed for, uh, or, or certainly had an invasion to take place over a number of days and a number of days advance. But armies plan all the time and armies develop plans all the time for scenarios that might not be in existence. And the Germans were great planners. So um, could it have been put into, the, into effect? I, I, I don't know, I, I don't think so. The, the British threat was far more real, I, I think. And it was diplomacy that prevented that from happening as well as uh, military, military engagement or military, military diplomacy. Thank you. And um, finally, uh, you mentioned a website where uh, people can find some of those documents online. Which website was that again? That's the Documents on Irish Foreign Policy website. That's the, the project I, I, I run uh, through the Royal Irish Academy, uh, the National Archives and the Department of Foreign Affairs. It's www.difp.ie. And we also have a Twitter account at uh, DIFP underscore RIA and we, we publish documents on that as well. So Walsh's memo, uh, and some of the other documents I mentioned are available there. The military archives ones aren't, but there's a book called The Chief of Staff's Reports that I edited with Victor Lang, a uh, former archivist, uh, former commandant of the military archives, uh, that has a lot of that material in it. Brilliant, thank you so much. So um, it was a really, really interesting talk. Re really, really appreciate you joining us for the festival this afternoon. And thank you all for coming along to watch. Um, there are a couple more talks being uh, run in partnership with the Dublin Port Company. Uh, the first of those is tomorrow at the same time, 5pm, and that's with Dr. Pat McCarthy, A Dangerous Stretch of Water, World War II in the Irish Sea. 
Um, and the second one is this Thursday, the 1st of October at five again, and that's the shaping of Dublin Port in the 19th century with Eamon O'Reilly. So all that remains is just to thank you again, Michael, so much for, for that talk. And um, thank you all for coming along. And uh, do take a look on the festival website uh, for, for more events to sign up for. They're all free and we've got another week of them. And I hope you have a lovely rest of the evening. Thank you.